I would almost believe in God. But if I'm dissuaded, I am dissuaded by religion. If I'm an anthropologist, I love the diversity of religions. But I seek the truth of whether there is really a God, and the diversity of religions dispirits me. The incompatibility of core doctrines troubles deeply. Many believe only their own religion to be true. Some claim all religions reflect the same truth. Others assert that differing dogmas expose the emptiness of all religion. Can many religions all be true? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. The question is an easy one for atheists. No religion is true. So I'm more interested in how each religion handles this ever so sensitive subject. I start with Christianity and with Alvin Plantinga, who has reinvigorated Christian philosophy. Al's at Notre Dame, where we meet. Alvin. How do we begin to think about diversity of religions in the context of a conviction in our own? People have made two kinds of objections to belief in a specific religion. One of them is a, broadly speaking, moral objection, that there's something um, immoral in believing a certain proposition when you know that a lot of other people don't believe that. I don't see that there is anything morally wrong with believing it. That very claim itself is another one of those self-referentially incoherent claims that shoots itself in the foot. Because the person puts this forward, he says it's immoral in some way to believe when you know other people don't believe that way. But that very proposition is one that not very many people believe. So he himself is doing just exactly what he himself is condemning. The second suggestion is that if you know there are other people who don't believe the way you do on this topic, and you'd think also that you can't convince them, then there's something irrational in your continuing to believe the same way. But I, again, I really wonder about that. Uh, consider other areas of life, say politics, or for that matter, philosophy. I mean, philosophers disagree with each other all the time. Do you believe that all religions are looking at the same entity and seeing different elements of it? I mean, you're really asking me two questions. First, do I think that beliefs that conflict with mine are wrong, mistaken? Well, of course I do. I mean, there's no, <laughs> it can't be that they're both right if they're in conflict, you know. On the second one, could it be that all religions are sort of like groping after the same reality? I mean, if you take the most prevalent religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, in all of these religions, there is something like God. So one way to think about it, I suppose, is that these different religions, they're all in contact with the same being, but they differ with respect to some of God's properties or some of the things God has done. But I guess I would add to that that these approaches can't all be right. Where they're inconsistent, then uh, some of them are wrong. And I guess as a Christian, I'd have to say beliefs that are in conflict with Christian belief are mistaken. Al rejects the notion that it is improper, morally or rationally, to believe in one specific religion. Al is a marvelous apologist for Christianity, and he doesn't apologize for being so. But why Christianity? Richard Swinburne, emeritus professor at Oxford, is renowned for his careful analysis of theological issues. 
So how does Richard deal with the claims of multiple religions? We have these common criteria for judging the worth of theories, whether they're theories of science, history, or anything else. The theory is probably true insofar as if it's true, you would expect the data. If it's false, you wouldn't expect the data. And it's a simple theory. And we can judge religions by these criteria. The first issue is, is there a God? Not all religions believe there's a God or think that is important for them. And therefore the issue is, do the arguments for the existence of God render it probable that there is a God? I think they do. Um, and I think the simplest explanation of the uh, existence of the universe, its conformity to uh, order, the laws of nature being such as to lead to our evolution, and the existence of consciousness and so on, are such as satisfy these criteria. So uh, that will rule out the non-theistic religions, such as Buddhism or various forms of Hinduism. And that will leave us with the theistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, certain forms of Hinduism, and so on. Now, how do they differ? Well, they differ in the properties they ascribe to God and in the actions that they ascribe to God. So we must look at the evidence as to whether God does have these properties and whether God has done these actions. But the main uh, criterion for distinguishing between them is that all such religions claim that God has made a revelation of, to human beings. So uh, how are we to compare competing revelations? The answer is, uh, if, any, uh, if take an analogy, uh, if you receive a, a letter from, from somebody which tells you something, um, you uh, need to uh, find out who it's from. And if we can find out that the revelation comes from God, then that is reason to suppose it's true. How would you find out that it comes from God? Well, we uh, authenticate letters by their handwriting and their signature. What sort of things are signatures of God? Well, there's one thing that God alone can do, uh, and that is alter the, or intervene in, violate the laws of nature. Uh, if an event occurs which is contrary to the laws of nature, which involves setting aside the laws of nature, then that can only be done by the person who keeps the laws of nature operative. And if um, a revelation has a signature on it in the form of an event which God alone can bring about, then that is reason to suppose that the uh, revelation is true. Now... I think Christianity is uniquely positioned in this respect because the signature in question is the resurrection of Jesus. If this occurred as traditionally asserted, then clearly it was a violation of the law of nature. Is, is it possible that God could give conflicting revelations to different groups? Well, not if he reveals certain propositions and uh, he says to one, uh, God is uh, a trinity, and he says to another, God is not a trinity, then clearly one of these must be false. But um, if we're considering theistic religions, they've got an awful lot in common. But of course they do differ, and in particular in that example, the doctrine of the trinity is denied in the Quran explicitly and affirmed in Christianity, so there is a conflict here. It's no surprise that Christianity sees itself as the only way to God. Christianity's claim is based on the resurrection of Jesus. Fair enough. But it's a claim that other religions obviously do not accept. So what do other religions claim? I start with my own heritage. What does Judaism profess? about its own uniqueness. I'm really not sure. Rabbi Arthur Hyman, professor of philosophy at Yeshiva University, is an expert on Jewish thought. Surely he can enlighten me. Arthur, from Judaism's point of view, how do you look at diverse religions? How do you authenticate them? And what do you do about this? obvious conflict. I think there are two issues here. That there is the abstract issue of how does Judaism look at other religions. Yeah. Uh, and here there, there is actually 
a legal term that that is used tries to solve that issue. It's called Hasidei Umot Ha'olam, the righteous people of the world to come. Mm -hmm. And these people are expect, expected to observe what's called the seven Noachite commandments, believe in God, uh, believe in justice, uh, not to murder, not to steal, and so on. And these are called Noachide because they are pre-Abrahamic in pre a Pre-Abrahamic, and, and they come out of, out of that the rabbis uh, extracted them from whatever is known about the pre-Abrahamic uh, world. So that on the Jewish end, there is a kind of a recognition that there are many different kinds of religions and what is acceptable as a religion. But then there is also the historical aspect that Jews throughout the ages, particularly in the Middle Ages, were forced uh, to have discussions uh, with Christians. So for historical reasons, in these situations, Jews, let's say, would try to show why Christianity would not be an acceptable religion because it has an unacceptable belief in God. So I think uh, what happens, at least in the modern world, is that there would be a toleration of other religions, but I think the claim would not be that all religions are equally valid. I think in the end, if you belong to a religion, uh, whether it is Judaism or Christianity or Islam, the claim would be whatever the value is of other religions, our religion is the best. Now, just because a person thinks that my religion is better than other religions, does that mean uh, we have to persecute people of other religions? I think in general, uh, Jewish thinkers would feel that, that as long uh, as non-Jews observe these, uh, these commandments, they have a part in the world to come in, in the afterlife. While Judaism holds that being a Jew is the right road to God, it appreciates that other religions may also arrive there, and non-Jews participate in the good afterlife. Now for the third religion that descended from Abraham, Islam. I speak with one of Islam's foremost living philosophers, Sayyid Hossein Nasser, professor at George Washington University. We are immediately confronted by the fact that there are two poles that determine the way we think. One is, in a sense, universalism, one is particularism. For example, you think of a triangle. A triangle is a triangle, it's a universal mathematical concept. But you never see a triangle. You say this triangle, you're playing pool and there is that triangular figure you put the balls in. And that's a particular triangle. And so our experience oscillates, both mentally and outwardly, between what you call the universal and the particular in the philosophical sense. You see incredible universal characteristics which manifest themselves in all the religions. For example, do unto others as others would have to do unto you, or some formula similar to it, is different from specific moral action in different religions. But it's a spiritual moral quality that is, is universal, as we find everywhere. So everywhere, whether you're within Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, wherever you are, in a sense, you have a particularity of that universal principle. On the metaphysical level, it's even more evident. First of all, reality is not exhausted by the physical world in which we live. This reality has a transcendent and imminent aspect to it. And between us that, and that reality, which is boundless and without finitude, there are levels of reality which separate us. Prenal philosophy also respects particularity within each religion and considers it to be very important because there is no path to either truth or the truth, without being a path. For example, Islam has remarkable universal characteristics which it shares, let's say, with Christianity and Judaism. But at the same time, it has its own particularity. For example, the adamant refusal to distinguish between the kingdom of Caesar and the kingdom of God. Even the word secularism doesn't exist. 
in Arabic and Persian. And the way that we are not trying to force the separation upon Middle Eastern countries is never going to work because uh, it doesn't go with how they understand God and themselves and the role of religion and life and everything else. We live in a world today in which, whether we like it or not, awareness of other world views, other religions, other cultures has become a necessity. And therefore, perennial philosophy has a very important role to play in revealing both the universality of religious truth and the particularity of religion in different climes with which Western men or Eastern men come in contact today. But Islamic philosophy, like traditional Christian Jewish philosophy, like Hindu philosophy, is one of the great schools of perennial philosophy, and it itself, in a sense, is both universal, the aspects of it which reconfirm the perennial philosophy, and as particularities which pertain to the Islamic world where it has grown and manifested itself. To Hossein, to understand religion is to appreciate the balance between the universalism that unifies different religions and the particularism that distinguishes them. Still, are there many ways to God or only one? Maybe God must be thought anew. I must explore Buddhism. So I go to a Buddhist temple in Los Angeles, where I meet Dr. Ananda Guruje, a leading Buddhist thinker and former Sri Lankan diplomat. With the Buddha, there were no different religions. Uh, when a person wanted to change, uh, uh, give up his teacher and become a disciple of the Buddha, uh, the Buddha said, um, I'll accept you on uh, one condition. If you were helping that other man's institution financially and materially, you must continue to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, King Ashoka, who uh, lived 300 years after the Buddha, he wrote a very interesting edict for his people, saying that do not criticize another's religion unnecessarily. And then he added, each one should learn the other's religion. We do not believe that one religion is superior to another. We believe that each religion has addresses certain issues, certain questions, in the way that that community, that society at that time was prepared to accept. All that Buddha said, we don't accept as the gospel truth that we have to believe because Buddha preached, do not believe what is in the books. Do not believe what comes to you by rumor. Do not believe because you like the teacher. Think, think for yourself and ask the question, will this be for the good and the benefit of the many? So if another religion claims that it is the only way to truth, what would the Buddha say about that? May it be for you. I have no question about it at all. If that is the truth that you understand, but please don't take a gun or a sword and try to make the other person think the way you want. But the other religions may go further and say, it, it is the right way for me, but also it's the right way for you. Sharing that information, the, uh, the you know, Buddhist process is not only, the, don't wait till he asks you to learn it. You learn it on your own. That is what Ashoka said, you know, he said, <laughs> Did each one learn other person's religion. He didn't want the others to wait till somebody comes and says, my religion is the best learned. <laughs> you know, when I teach, when I speak, when I write about Buddhism, I want to share the, what I think are wonderful ideals of Buddhism with the rest of the world. Yes, we have something to share with the world, but we have nothing to, uh, to impose upon the world. To Ananda, Buddhism has something to share, but nothing to impose. A beautiful idea, harmony and truth. Both are best, 
but either can exist without the other. I hope for harmony, but my journey seeks truth. I cannot ignore Hinduism, the world's third largest religion, the world's oldest major religion. What is the Hindu approach to religious diversity? I ask V.V. Raman, a physicist from the Hindu tradition. Practically all religions believe that there is something more than the physical material world. Most religions believe there is one kind of God or another, uh, what by whatever name. Most religions believe that there is some supernatural agency in the universe. And most of all, all religions search for some kind of a connection with the whole. Every religion is an expression of the longing that is in the human spirit, whether it came from biological evolution, cultural evolution, it's a different thing. What the Hindu religion says is that we need to understand the basic fact that even though there may be but one God, that God is described in different ways by different people. If there are these diverse paths to truth, is any one or any series more privileged than the other being a better way? It is very difficult to speak of the right path in the religious context, it seems to me, because religion is a quest for self-fulfillment. Inherent in the Hindu tradition, and for me that is the, the best part of it, is, are two things. One is that others may find fulfillment through other paths, and we need to respect that. And what brings spiritual fulfillment to an individual is not something that is prescribed elsewhere or by someone but what one achieves by one's own quest. And therefore, if you want to find spiritual fulfillment, which is different from finding the nature of ultimate reality, then you would choose a path which probably is in your own tradition. So whether that is the ultimate reality, I cannot say, because ultimate reality is far more uh, complex than uh, finding spiritual fulfillment. I would love to find spiritual fulfillment, but I don't want to fool myself. You know, the fact that there are different people who undertake this quest and find satisfaction in different ways is a truth. Whether what they believe in is the ultimate truth or reality, we cannot say, uh, be sure, even the Hindu, uh, the Vedas, that is an interesting uh, line in the hymn of creation, which ends by saying, who really knows? Not even the gods may know how it all came to be. Desiring to believe in God, yet facing a bewildering array of often warring religions, I start with two principles. First, respect peaceful religions and grant to every human being the right to believe or not to believe as he or she so freely chooses. Second, respect for religions and rights for their believers do not mean that contradictory explanations of existence are all somehow set equal. As for me, I rely on critical thinking, giving no privilege to tradition or custom or accident of birth. I do not forbid faith from supplanting reason, but I am offended when religious motivation comes in disguise. 
If God does not exist, explanation is easy. Religious diversity is just cultural expression, the natural developments of anthropological actions. If God does exist, I'd wonder whether our problem is not religions too many, but perhaps one religion too few. Could something be missing? Getting closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.